Chapter XX They asked us considerable many questions, wanted to know what we covered up the raft that way for, and laid by in the daytime instead of running, was Jim a runaway nigger? Says I, goodness sakes! Would a runaway nigger run south? No, they allowed he wouldn't. I had to account for things some way, so I says, my folks was living in Pike County, in Missouri, where I was born, and they all died off but me and Pa and my brother Ike. Pa, he lowed he'd break up and go down and live with Uncle Ben, who's got a little one-horse place on the river, 44 mile below Orleans. Pa was pretty poor and had some debts so when he'd squared up there weren't nothing left but $16 and our nigger, Jim. That weren't enough to take us 1400 mile, deck passage nor no other way. Well, when the river rose Pa had a streak of luck one day he catch this piece of a raft so we reckoned we'd go down to Orleans on it. Pa's luck didn't hold out, a steamboat run over the forward corner of the raft one night, and we all went overboard and dove under the wheel, Jim and me come up all right, but Pa was drunk and Ike was only four years old, so they never come up no more. Well, for the next day or two we had considerable trouble, because people was always coming out in skiffs and trying to take Jim away from me saying they believed he was a runaway nigger. We don't run daytimes no more now, nights they don't bother us. The Duke says, leave me alone to cipher out a way so we can run in the daytime if we want to. I'll think the thing over, I'll invent a plan that'll fix it. We'll let it alone for today, because of course we don't want to go by that town yonder in daylight, it mightn't be healthy. Towards night it begun to darken up and look like rain, the heat lightning was squirting around low down in the sky, and the leaves was beginning to shiver it. Was going to be pretty ugly it was easy to see that. So the Duke and the King went to overhauling our wigwam to see what the beds was like. My bed was a straw tick better than Jim's which was a corn shuck tick, there's always cobs around about in a shuck tick and they poke into you and hurt, and when you roll over the dry shucks sound like you was rolling over in a pile of dead leaves, it makes such a rustling that you wake up. Well the Duke allowed he would take my bed, but the King allowed he wouldn't. He says, I should have reckoned the difference in rank would have suggested to you that a corn shuck bed weren't just fitten for me to sleep on. Your grace LL take the shuck bed yourself. Jim and me was in a sweat again for a minute, being afraid there was going to be some more trouble amongst them, so we was pretty glad when the duke says, tis my fate to be always ground into the mire under the iron heel of oppression. Misfortune has broken my once haughty spirit, I yield, I submit, tis my fate. I am alone in the world, let me suffer, can bear it. We got away as soon as it was good and dark. The king told us to stand well out towards the middle of the river and not show a light till we got a long ways below the town. We come in sight of the little bunch of lights by and by that was the town you know and slid by about a half a mile out all right. When we was three quarters of a mile below we hoisted up our signal lantern and about 10 o'clock it come on to rain and blow and thunder and lighten like everything, so the king told us to both stay on watch till the weather got better, then him and the duke crawled into the wigwam and turned in for the night. It was my watch below till 12, but I wouldn't a turned in anyway if I'd had a bed, because a body don't see such a storm as that every day in the week, not by a long sight. My souls how the wind did scream along and every second or two there'd come a glare that lit up the white caps for a half a mile around, and you'd see the islands looking dusty through the rain, and the trees thrashing around in the wind, then comes a h-whack, bum, bum, bum 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 and the thunder would go rumbling and grumbling away, and quit, and then r.i.p. comes another flash and another sock dollager. The waves most washed me off the raft sometimes, but I hadn't any clothes on, and didn't mind. We didn't have no trouble about snags, the lightning was glaring and flittering around so constant that we could see them plenty soon enough to throw her head this way or that and miss them. I had the middle watch you know, but I was pretty sleepy by that time, so Jim he said he would stand the first half of it for me, he was always mighty good that way, Jim was. I crawled into the wigwam, but the king and the duke had their Legs sprawled around so there weren't no show for me so I laid outside, I didn't mind the rain, because it was warm and the waves weren't running so high now. 
About 2 they come up again though and Jim was going to call me, but he changed his mind, because he reckoned they weren't high enough yet to do any harm, but he was mistaken about that, for pretty soon all of a sudden along comes a regular ripper and washed me overboard. It most killed Jim A laughing. He was the easiest nigger to laugh that ever was anyway. I took the watch, and Jim he laid down and snored away, and by and by the storm let up for good and all, and the first cabin light that showed I rousted him out, and we slid the raft into hiding quarters for the day. The king got out an old ratty deck of cards after breakfast and him and the duke played seven up a while, five cents a game. Then they got tired of it and allowed they would a lay out a campaign, as they called it. The duke went down into his carpet bag and fetched up a lot of little printed bills and read them out loud. One bill said, the celebrated Dr. Armand de Montalban of Paris, would lecture on the science of phrenology, at such and such a place, on the blank day of blank, at 10 cents admission, and furnish charts of character at 20, 5 cents apiece. The duke said that was him. In another bill he was the world-renowned Shakespearean tragedian, Garrick the Younger, of Drury Lane, London. In other bills he had a lot of other names and done other wonderful things, like finding water and gold with a divining rod, dissipating which spells, and so on. By and by he says, but the histrionic muse is the darling. Have you ever trod the board's royalty? No, says the king. You shall then, before you're three days older, fall in grandeur, says the duke. The first good town we come to will hire a hall and do the sword fight in Richard III. And the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. How does that strike you? I'm in up to the hub, for anything that will pay, bilge water, but, you see, I don't know nothing about play actin' and hain't ever seen much of it. I was too small when pap used to have him at the palace. Do you reckon you can learn me? Easy. All right. I'm just a freezin for something fresh anyway. Please commence right away. So the Duke he told him all about who Romeo was and who Juliet was and said he was used to being Romeo so the king could be Juliet. But if Juliet's such a young gal Duke, my peeled head and my white whiskers is going to look uncommon odd on her, maybe. No, don't you worry, these country jakes won't ever think of that. Besides, you know, you'll be in costume, and that makes all the difference in the world. Juliet's in a balcony, enjoying the moonlight before she goes to bed, and she's got on her nightgown and her ruffled nightcap. Here are the costumes for the parts. See 20-170.jpg 62k. He got out two or three curtain calico suits, which he said was medieval armor for Richard III and t'other chap and a long white cotton nightshirt and a ruffled nightcap to match. The king was satisfied, so the duke got out his book and read the parts over in the most splendid spread eagle way, prancing around and acting at the same time, to show how it had got to be done, then he give the book to the king and told him to get his part by heart. There was a little one-horse town about three mile down the bend and after dinner the duke said he had ciphered out his idea about how to run in daylight without it being dangerous for Jim so he allowed he would go down to the town and fix that thing. The king allowed he would go too and see if he couldn't strike something. We was out of coffee so Jim said I better go along with them in the canoe and get some. When we got there there weren't nobody stirring, streets empty, and perfectly dead and still like Sunday. We found a sick nigger sunning himself in a backyard, and he said everybody that weren't too young or too sick or too old was gone to camp meeting, about two mile back in the woods. The king got the directions and allowed he'd go and work that camp meeting for all it was worth, and I might go, too. The duke said what he was after was a printing office. We found it, a little bit of a concern up over a carpenter shop, carpenters and printers all gone to the meeting and no doors locked. It was a dirty, littered up place and had ink marks and handbills with pictures of horses and runaway niggers on them all over the walls. The duke shed his coat and said he was all right now. So me and the king lit out for the camp meeting. We got there in about a half an hour fairly dripping for it was a most awful hot day. There was as much as a thousand people there from twenty mile around. 
The woods was full of teams and wagons hitched everywheres, feeding out of the wagon troughs and stomping to keep off the flies. There was sheds made out of poles and roofed over with branches, where they had lemonade and gingerbread to sell, and piles of watermelons and green corn and such like truck. The preaching was going on under the same kinds of sheds, only they was bigger and held crowds of people. The benches was made out of outside slabs of logs, with holes bored in the round side to drive sticks into for legs. They didn't have no backs. The preachers had high platforms to stand on at one end of the sheds. The women had on sunbonnets and some had Lindsay Woolsey frocks, some gingham ones, and a few of the young ones had on calico. Some of the young men was barefooted and some of the children didn't have on any clothes but just a tow linen shirt. Some of the old women was knitting and some of the young folks was courting on the sly. The first shed we come to the preacher was lining out a him. He lined out two lines, everybody sung it, and it was kind of grand to hear it, there was so many of them and they done it in such a rousing way, then he lined out two more for them to sing, and so on. The people woke up more and more, and sung louder and louder, and towards the end some begun to groan, and some begun to shout. Then the preacher begun to preach and begun in earnest too, and went weaving first to one side of the platform and then the other, and then a leaning down over the front of it, with his arms and his body going all the time, and shouting his words out with all his might, and every now and then he would hold up his Bible and spread it open, and kind of pass it around this way, and that, shouting, it's the brazen serpent in the wilderness. Look upon it and live. And people would shout out, Glory, Amen. And so he went on, and the people groaning and crying and saying, Amen, Oh, come to the mourner's bench. Come, black with sin. Amen. Come, sick and sore. Amen. Come, lame and halt and blind. Amen. Come, poor and needy, sunk in shame. Amen. Come, all that's worn and soiled and suffering, come with a broken spirit. Come with a contrite heart. Come in your rags and sin and dirt. The waters that cleanse is free, the door of heaven stands open, oh, enter in and be at rest. Amen. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And so on. You couldn't make out what the preacher said any more on account of the shouting and crying. Folks got up everywheres in the crowd and worked their way just by main strength to the mourners' bench, with the tears running down their faces, and when all the mourners had got up there to the front benches in a crowd, they sung and shouted and flung themselves down on the straw, just crazy and wild. Well, the first I knowed the king got a-going, and you could hear him over everybody, and next he went a-charging up onto the platform, and the preacher he begged him to speak to the people, and he done it. He told them he was a pirate, been a pirate for thirty years out in the Indian Ocean, and his crew was thinned out considerable last spring in a fight, and he was home now to take out some fresh men, and thanks to goodness he'd been robbed last night and put ashore off of a steamboat without a cent, and he was glad of it, it was the blessedest thing that ever happened to him because he was a changed man now, and happy for the first time in his life, and poor as he was he was going to start right off and work his way back to the Indian Ocean and put in the rest of his life trying to turn the pirates into the true path, for he could do it better than anybody else being acquainted with all pirate crews in that ocean, and though it would take him a long time to get there without money, he would get there anyway and every time he convinced a pirate he would say to him, don't you thank me, don't you give me no credit, it all belongs to them dear people in Polkville camp meeting, natural brothers and benefactors of the race, and that dear preacher there, the truest friend a pirate ever had. And then he busted into tears and so did everybody. Then somebody sings out, take up a collection for him, take up a collection. Well a half a dozen made a jump to do it, but somebody sings out, let him pass the hat around. Then everybody said it, the preacher too. So the king went all through the crowd with his hat swabbing his eyes and blessing the people and praising them and thanking them for being so good to the poor pirates away off there, and every little while the prettiest kind of girls, with the tears running down their cheeks, would up and ask him would he let them kiss him for to remember him by, and he always done it, and some of them he hugged and kissed as many as five or six times, and he was invited to stay a week and everybody wanted. 
him to live in their houses and said they'd think it was an honor, but he said as this was the last day of the camp meeting he couldn't do no good, and besides he was in a sweat to get to the Indian Ocean right off and go to work on the pirates. When we got back to the raft and he come to count up he found he had collected $87.75. And then he had fetched away a three-gallon jug of whiskey, too, that he found under a wagon when he was starting home through the woods. The king said, take it all around, it laid over any day he'd ever put in in the missionarying line. He said it weren't no use talking, heathens don't amount to shucks alongside of pirates to work a camp meeting with. The duke was thinking he'd been doing pretty well till the king come to show up, but after that he didn't think so so much. He had set up and printed off two little jobs for farmers in that printing office, horse bills, and took the money, four dollars. And he had gotten ten dollars worth of advertisements for the paper, which he said he would put in for four dollars if they would pay in advance, so they done it. The price of the paper was two dollars a year, but he took in three subscriptions for half a dollar apiece on condition of them paying him in advance, they were going to pay in cordwood and onions as usual, but he said he had just bought the concern and knocked down the price as low as he could afford it and was going to run it for cash. He set up a little piece of poetry, which he made himself, out of his own head, three verses, kind of sweet and saddish, the name of it was, yes, crush, cold world, this breaking heart, and he left that all set up and ready to print in the paper, and didn't charge nothing for it. Well, he took in nine dollars and a half, and said he'd done a pretty square day's work for it. Then he showed us another little job he'd printed and hadn't charged for, because it was for us. It had a picture of a runaway nigger with a bundle on a stick over his shoulder and $200 reward under it. The reading was all about Jim and just described him to a dot. It said he run away from St. Jacques Plantation, 40 mile below New Orleans, last winter and likely went north, and whoever would catch him and send him back he could have the reward and expenses. Now, says the Duke, after tonight we can run in the daytime if we want to. Whenever we see anybody coming we can tie Jim hand and foot with a rope and lay him in the wigwam and show this handbill and say we captured him up the river and were too poor to travel on a steamboat, so we got this little raft on credit from our friends and are going down to get the reward. Handcuffs and chains would look still better on Jim, but it wouldn't go well with the story of us being so poor. Too much like jewelry. Ropes are the correct thing, we must preserve the unities as we say on the boards. We all said the duke was pretty smart and there couldn't be no trouble about running daytimes. We judged we could make miles enough that night to get out of the reach of the powwow we reckoned the duke's work in the printing office was going to make in that little town, then we could boom right along if we wanted to. We laid low and kept still and never shoved out till nearly 10 o'clock, then. We slid by pretty wide away from the town and didn't hoist our lantern till we was clear out of sight of it. When Jim called me to take the watch at 4 in the morning he says, Huck, does you reckon we gwine to run across any M.O. Kings on dis trip? No, I says, I, I reckon not. Well, says he, dat's all right, den. I don't mind one or two kings, but dat's enough. Dis one's powerful drunk and de duke ein much better. I found Jim had been trying to get him to talk French so he could hear what it was like but he said he had been in this country so long and had so much trouble, he'd forgot it. Chapter 21 IT was after sunup now but we went right on and didn't tie up. The king and the duke turned out by and by looking pretty rusty, but after they'd jumped overboard and took a swim it chippered them up a good deal. After breakfast the king he took a seat on the corner of the raft and pulled off his boots and rolled up his breeches and let his legs dangle in the water so as to be comfortable and lit his pipe and went to getting his Romeo and Juliet by heart. When he had got it pretty good him and the duke begun to practice it together. The duke had to learn him over and over again how to say every speech and he made him sigh and put his hand on his heart, and after a while he said he'd done it pretty well, only, he says, you mustn't bellow out Romeo. That way like a bull you must say it soft and sick and languishy so aro Romeo. That is the idea, for Juliet's a dear sweet mere child of a girl you know and she doesn't bray like a jackass. 
Well, next they got out a couple of long swords that the duke made out of oak laths and begun to practice the sword fight, the duke called himself Richard III, and the way they laid on and pranced around the raft was grand to see. But by and by the king tripped and fell overboard and after that they took a rest and had a talk about all kinds of adventures they'd had in other times along the river. After dinner the duke says, well cape it, we'll want to make this a first class show you know so I guess we'll add a little more to it. We want a little something to answer encores with anyway. What's encores bilge water? The duke told him and then says, I'll answer by doing the highland fling or the sailor's hornpipe, and you, well, let me see, oh, I've got it, you can do Hamlet's soliloquy. Hamlet's which? Hamlet's soliloquy you know, the most celebrated thing in Shakespeare. Ah it's sublime sublime. Always fetches the house. I haven't got it in the book, I've only got one volume, but I reckon I can piece it out from memory. I'll just walk up and down a minute and see if I can call it back from recollections vaults. So he went to marching up and down, thinking, and frowning horrible every now and then. Then he would hoist up his eyebrows, next he would squeeze his hand on his forehead and stagger back and kind of moan, next he would sigh and next he'd let on to drop a tear. It was beautiful to see him. By and by he got it. He told us to give attention. Then he strikes a most noble attitude, with one leg shoved forwards and his arms stretched away up, and his head tilted back, looking up at the sky, and then he begins to rip and rave and grit his teeth and... After that all through his speech he howled and spread around and swelled up his chest and just knocked the spots out of any acting ever I see before. This is the speech I learned it easy enough while he was learning it to the king. To be or not to be, that is the bare bodkin that makes calamity of so long life, for who would Fardell's bear, till Burnham would do come to Dunsinane, but that the fear of something after death murders the innocent sleep, great nature's second course, and makes us rather sling the arrows of outrageous fortune than fly to others that we know not of. There's the respect must give us pause, wake Duncan with thy knocking. I would thou couldst, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the law's delay, and the quietus which his pangs might take. In the dead waste and middle of the night, when churchyards yawn in customary suits of solemn black, but that the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, breathes forth contagion on the world, and thus the native hue of resolution, like the poor cat I the adage, is sicklied o'er with care. And all the clouds that lowered o'er our house tops, with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. But soft you, the fair Ophelia, ope not thy ponderous and marble jaws. But get thee to a nunnery, go. Well, the old man he liked that speech and he mighty soon got it so he could do it first rate. It seemed like he was just born for it, and when he had his hand in and was excited, it was perfectly lovely the way he would rip and tear and rear up behind when he was getting it off. The first chance we got, the duke he had some show bills printed, and after that, for two or three days as we floated along, the raft was a most uncommon lively place, for there weren't nothing but sword fighting and rehearsing, as the duke called it, going on all the time. One morning, when we was pretty well down the state of Arkansas, we come in sight of a little one-horse town in a big bend, so we tied up about three-quarters of a mile above it, in the mouth of a creek which was shut in like a tunnel by the cypress trees, and all of us but Jim. Took the canoe and went down there to see if there was any chance in that place for our show. We struck it mighty lucky, there was going to be a circus there that afternoon and the country people was already beginning to come in, in all kinds of old shackly wagons and on horses. The circus would leave before night so our show would have a pretty good chance. The duke he hired the courthouse and we went around and stuck up our bills. They read like this. Then we went loafing around the town. The stores and houses was most all old shackly dried up frame concerns that hadn't ever been painted, they was set up three or four foot above ground on stilts so as to be out of reach of the water when the river was overflowed. The houses had little gardens around them, but they didn't seem to raise hardly anything in them but jimson weeds, and sunflowers, and ash piles, and old curled up boots and shoes, and pieces of bottles, and rags, and played out tinware. 
The fences was made of different kinds of boards, nailed on at different times, and they leaned every which way, and had gates that didn't generally have but one hinge, a leather one. Some of the fences had been whitewashed some time or another, but the Duke said it was in Columbus's time, like enough. There was generally hogs in the garden and people driving them out. All the stores was along one street. They had white domestic awnings in front and the country people hitched their horses to the awning posts. There was empty dry goods boxes under the awnings and loafers roosting on them all day long, whittling them with their barlow knives and chawing tobacco and gaping and yawning and stretching, a mighty ornery lot. They generally had on yellow straw hats most as wide as an umbrella, but didn't wear no coats nor waistcoats, they called one another Bill and Buck and Hank and Joe and Andy and talked lazy and drawly and used considerable many cuss words. There was as many as one loafer leaning up against every awning post, and he most always had his hands in his breeches pockets, except when he fetched them out to lend a chaw of tobacco or scratch. What a body was hearing amongst them all the time was, gimme a cha v2 backer Hank. Can't I hain't got but one cha left. Ask Bill. Maybe Bill he gives him a cha, maybe he lies and says he ain't got none. Some of them kinds of loafers never has a cent in the world, nor a cha of tobacco of their own. They get all their chawing by borrowing, they say to a fellow, I wished you'd lend me a cha, Jack, I just this minute give Ben Thompson the last cha I had, which is a lie pretty much every time, it don't fool nobody but a stranger, but Jack ain't no stranger, so he says, you give him a cha, did you? So did your sister's cat's grandmother. You pay me back the chas you've already buried off and me, Leif Buckner, then I'll loan you one or two ton of it, and won't charge you no back in trust, nuther. Well I did pay you back some of it once. Yes you did, bout six chas. You borrowed store two backer and paid back nigger head. Store tobacco is flat black plug, but these fellows mostly chas the natural leaf twisted. When they borrow a cha they don't generally cut it off with a knife, but set the plug in between their teeth and gnaw with their teeth and tug at the plug with their hands till they get it in two. Then sometimes the one that owns the tobacco looks mournful at it when it's handed back and says, sarcastic, here, gimme the cha, and you take the plug. All the streets and lanes was just mud, they weren't nothing else but mud, mud as black as tar and nigh about a foot deep in some places, and two or three inches deep in all the places. The hogs loafed and grunted around everywheres. You'd see a muddy sow and a litter of pigs come lazying along the street and hollop herself right down in the way, where folks had to walk around her, and she'd stretch out and shut her eyes and wave her ears whilst the pigs was milking her, and look as happy as if she was on salary. And pretty soon you'd hear a loafer sing out, hi. So boy. Sick him, Tige, and away the sow would go, squealing most horrible, with a dog or two swinging to each ear, and three or four dozen more a coming, and then you would see all the loafers get up and watch the thing out of sight, and laugh at the fun and look grateful for the noise. Then they'd settle back again till there was a dog fight. There couldn't anything wake them up all over and make them happy all over, like a dog fight, unless it might be putting turpentine on a stray dog and setting fire to him, or tying a tin pan to his tail and see him run himself to death. On the river front some of the houses was sticking out over the bank and they was bowed and bent and about ready to tumble in. The people had moved out of them. The bank was caved away under one corner of some others and that corner was hanging over. People lived in them yet, but it was dangersome, because sometimes a strip of land as wide as a house caves in at a time. Sometimes a belt of land a quarter of a mile deep will start in and cave along and cave along till it all caves into the river in one summer. Such a town as that has to be always moving back and back and back because the river's always gnawing at it. The nearer it got to noon that day the thicker and thicker was the wagons and horses in the streets, and more coming all the time. Families fetch their dinners with them from the country and eat them in the wagons. There was considerable whiskey drinking going on and I seen three fights. By and by somebody sings out. Here comes old Boggs, in from the country for his little old monthly drunk, here he comes boys. All the loafers looked glad I reckon they was used to having fun out of Boggs. One of them says, wonder who he's egg wine to char up this time. 
If he'd a chawed up all the men he's been a gwine to chaw up in the last 20 year he'd have considerable reputation now. Another one says, I wished old Boggs d threaten me, cause then I'd know I weren't gwine to die for a thousand year. Boggs comes a tearing along on his horse, whooping and yelling like an engine, and singing out, Claire the track thar. I'm on the vav path, and the price uv coffins is a gwine to raise. He was drunk and weaving about in his saddle, he was over 50 year old, and had a very red face. Everybody yelled at him and laughed at him and sassed him, and he sassed back, and said he'd attend to them and lay them out in their regular turns, but he couldn't wait now because he'd come to town to kill old Colonel Sherburn, and his motto was, meat first, and spoon vittles to top off on. He see me and rode up and says, Ward you come FM, boy? You prepared to die. Then he rode on. I was scared, but a man says, he don't mean nothing, he's always a carry yin on like that when he's drunk. He's the best naturedest old fool in Arkansas, never hurt nobody, drunk nor sober. Boggs rode up before the biggest store in town and bent his head down so he could see under the curtain of the awning and yells, come out here, Sherburn. Come out and meet the man you've swindled. You're the hound I'm after and I'm a gwine to have you too. And so he went on calling Sherburn everything he could lay his tongue to and the whole street packed with people listening and laughing and going on. By and by a proud looking man about 55 and he was a heap the best dressed man in that town too steps out of the store and the crowd drops back on each side to let him come. He says to Boggs mighty CM and slow he says I'm tired of this but I'll endure it till one o'clock. Till one o'clock mind no longer. If you open your mouth against me only once after that time you can't travel so far but I will find you. Then he turns and goes in. The crowd looked mighty sober, nobody stirred, and there weren't no more laughing. Boggs rode off blackguarding Sherburn as loud as he could yell all down the street and pretty soon back he comes and stops before the store, still keeping it up. Some men crowded around him and tried to get him to shut up, but he wouldn't, they told him it would be 1 o'clock in about 15 minutes, and so he must go home, he must go right away. But it didn't do no good. He cussed away with all his might and throwed his hat down in the mud and rode over it, and pretty soon away he went a raging down the street again, with his grey hair a flying. Everybody that could get a chance at him tried their best to coax him off of his horse so they could lock him up and get him sober, but it weren't no use, up the street he would tear again and give Sherburn another cussing. By and by somebody says, go for his daughter, quick, go for his daughter, sometimes he'll listen to her. If anybody can persuade him she can. So somebody started on a run. I walked down street a ways and stopped. In about 5 or 10 minutes here comes Boggs again, but not on his horse. He was a reeling across the street towards me bareheaded, with a friend on both sides of him a holt of his arms and hurrying him along. He was quiet and looked uneasy, and he weren't hanging back any, but was doing some of the hurrying himself. Somebody sings out, E Boggs. I looked over there to see who said it and it was that Colonel Sherburn. He was standing perfectly still in the street and had a pistol raised in his right hand, not aiming it, but holding it out with the barrel tilted up towards the sky. The same second I see a young girl coming on the run and two men with her. Boggs. And the men turned round to see who called him and when they see the pistol the men jump to one side and the pistol barrel come down slow and steady to a level, both barrels cocked. Boggs throws up both of his hands and says, Oh Lord, don't shoot. Bang! Goes the first shot and he staggers back, clawing at the air, bang! Goes the second one, and he tumbles backwards onto the ground, heavy and solid, with his arms spread out. That young girl screamed out and comes rushing, and down she throws herself on her father, crying, and saying, Oh, he's killed him, he's killed him. The crowd closed up around them and shouldered and jammed one another, with their necks stretched, trying to see, and people on the inside trying to shove them back and shouting, back, back. Give him air, give him air. Colonel Sherburn he tossed his pistol onto the ground and turned around on his heels and walked off. 
they took Boggs to a little drug store, the crowd pressing around just the same and the whole town following and I rushed and got a good place at the window where I was close to him and could see in. They laid him on the floor and put one large Bible under his head and opened another one and spread it on his breast, but they tore open his shirt first and I seen where one of the bullets went in. He made about a dozen long gasps, his breast lifting the Bible up when he drawed in his breath and letting it down again when he breathed it out, and after that he laid still, he was dead. Then they pulled his daughter away from him screaming and crying and took her off. She was about 16 and very sweet and gentle looking but awful pale and scared. Well, pretty soon the whole town was there, squirming and scrooging and pushing and shoving to get at the window and have a look, but people that had the places wouldn't give them up, and folks behind them was saying all the time, say now you've looked enough, you fellows, taint right and taint fair for. You to stay there all the time and never give nobody a chance, other folks has their rights as well as you. There was considerable jawing back so I slid out, thinking maybe there was going to be trouble. The streets was full and everybody was excited. Everybody that seen the shooting was telling how it happened, and there was a big crowd packed around each one of these fellows stretching their necks and listening. One long, lanky man, with long hair and a big white fur stovepipe hat on the back of his head and a crooked-handled cane, marked out the places on the ground where Boggs stood and where Sherburn stood, and the people following him around from one place to t'other and watching everything he'd done, and bobbing their heads to show they understood, and stooping a little and resting their hands on their thighs to watch him mark the places on the ground with his cane. And then he stood up straight. And stiff where Sherburn had stood, frowning and having his hat brim down over his eyes, and sung out, Boggs, and then fetched his cane down slow to a level and says, bang, staggered backwards says, bang, again, and fell down flat on his back. The people that had seen the thing said he done it perfect, said it was just exactly the way it all happened. Then as much as a dozen people got out their bottles and treated him. Well, by and by somebody said Sherburn ought to be lynched. In about a minute everybody was saying it, so away they went mad and yelling and snatching down every clothesline they come to to do the hanging with. Chapter 22 They swarmed up towards Sherburn's house a whooping and raging like. Engines and everything had to clear the way or get run over and tromped to mush and it was awful to see. Children was healing it ahead of the mob, screaming and trying to get out of the way, and every window along the road was full of women's heads, and there was nigger boys in every tree, and bucks and wenches looking over every fence, and as soon as the mob would get nearly to them they would break and scattle back out of reach. Lots of the women and girls was crying and taking on, scared most to death. They swarmed up in front of Sherburn's palings as thick as they could jam together, and you couldn't hear yourself think for the noise. It was a little 20-foot yard. Some sung out, tear down the fence. Tear down the fence. Then there was a racket of ripping and tearing and smashing, and down she goes, and the front wall of the crowd begins to roll in like a wave. Just then Sherburn steps out onto the roof of his little front porch, with a double-barrel gun in his hand, and takes his stand, perfectly CM and deliberate, not saying a word. The racket stopped and the wave sucked back. Sherburn never said a word, just stood there, looking down. The stillness was awful creepy and uncomfortable. Sherburn run his eye slow along the crowd, and wherever it struck the people tried a little to outgaze him, but they couldn't, they dropped their eyes and looked sneaky. Then pretty soon Sherburn sort of laughed, not the pleasant kind, but the kind that makes you feel like when you are eating bread that's got sand in it. Then he says slow and scornful, the idea of you lynching anybody, it's amusing. The idea of you thinking you had pluck enough to lynch a man. Because you're brave enough to tar and feather poor friendless cast out women that come along here, did that make you think you had grit enough to lay your hands on a man? Why, a man's safe in the hands of 10,000 of your kind as long as it's daytime and you're not behind him. Do I know you? I know you clear through. I was born and raised in the South and I've lived in the North so I know the average all around. The average man's a coward. In the north he lets anybody walk over him that wants to and goes home and prays for a humble spirit to bear it. 
in the south one man all by himself has stopped a stage full of men in the daytime and robbed the lot. Your newspapers call you a brave people so much that you think you are braver than any other people, whereas you're just as brave and no braver. Why don't your juries hang murderers? Because they're afraid the man's friends will shoot them in the back in the dark and it's just what they would do. So they always acquit and then a man goes in the night with a hundred masked cowards at his back and lynches the rascal. Your mistake is that you didn't bring a man with you, that's one mistake and the other is that you didn't come in the dark and fetch your masks. You brought part of a man, Buck Harkness, there and if you hadn't had him to start you, you'd have taken it out in blowing. You didn't want to come. The average man don't like trouble and danger. You don't like trouble and danger. But if only half a man, like Buck Harkness, there shouts lynch him. Lynch him, you're afraid to back down, afraid you'll be found out to be what you are cowards, and so you raise a yell, and hang yourselves on to that half a man's coat tail, and come raging up here, swearing what big things you're going to do. The pitifulest thing out is a mob, that's what an army is, a mob, they don't fight with courage that's born in them, but with courage that's borrowed from their mass, and from their officers. But a mob without any man at the head of it is beneath pitifulness. Now the thing for you to do is to droop your tails and go home and crawl in a hole. If any real lynching's going to be done it will be done in the dark, southern fashion, and when they come they'll bring their masks and fetch a man along. Now leave and take your half a man with you, tossing his gun up across his left arm and cocking it when he says this. The crowd washed back sudden and then broke all apart and went tearing off every which way and Buck Harkness he healed it after them, looking tolerable cheap. I could have stayed if I wanted to, but I didn't want to. I went to the circus and loafed around the backside till the watchman went by and then dived in under the tent. I had my $20 gold piece and some other money, but I reckoned I better save it, because there ain't no telling how soon you are going to need it, away from home and amongst strangers that way. You can't be too careful. I ain't opposed to spending money on circuses when there ain't no other way, but there ain't no use in wasting it on them. It was a real bully circus. It was the splendidest sight that ever was when they all come riding in two and two, a gentleman and lady, side by side, the men just in their drawers and undershirts, and no shoes nor stirrups, and resting their hands on their thighs easy and comfortable, there must have been twenty of them, and every lady with a lovely complexion, and perfectly beautiful, and looking just like a gang of real sure enough queens, and dressed in clothes that cost millions of dollars and just littered with. Diamonds. It was a powerful fine sight, I never see anything so lovely. And then one by one they got up and stood and went a weaving around the ring so gentle and wavy and graceful, the men looking ever so tall and airy and straight, with their heads bobbing and skimming along, away up there under the tent roof, and every lady's rose leafy dress flapping soft and silky around her hips, and she looking like the most loveliest parasol. And then faster and faster they went, all of them dancing, first one foot out in the air and then the other, the horses leaning more and more, and the ringmaster going round and round the center pole, cracking his whip and shouting a hi, hi, and the clown cracking jokes behind him, and by and by all hands dropped the reins, and every lady put her knuckles on her hips and every gentleman folded his arms. And then how the horses did lean over and hump themselves. And so one after the other they all skipped off into the ring and made the sweetest bow I ever see and then scampered out and everybody clapped their hands and went just about wild. Well all through the circus they'd done the most astonishing things and all the time that clown carried on so it most killed the people. The ringmaster couldn't ever say a word to him but he was back at him quick as a wink with the funniest things a body ever said, and how he ever could think of so many of them, and so sudden and so pat, was what I couldn't no way understand. Why, I couldn't have thought of them in a year. And by and by a drunk man tried to get into the ring, said he wanted to ride, said he could ride as well as anybody that ever was. They argued and tried to keep him out, but he wouldn't listen, and the whole show come to a standstill. Then the people begun to holler at him and make fun of him and that made him mad and he begun to rip and tear so that stirred up the people and a lot of men begun to pile down off of the benches and swarm towards the ring saying knock him down throw him out and one or two women begun to scream 
So then the ringmaster he made a little speech and said he hoped there wouldn't be no disturbance and if the man would promise. He wouldn't make no more trouble he would let him ride if he thought he could stay on the horse. So everybody laughed and said all right and the man got on. The minute he was on, the horse begun to rip and tear and jump and cavort around, with two circus men hanging on to his bridle trying to hold him, and the drunk man hanging on to his neck, and his heels flying in the air every jump, and the whole crowd of people standing up shouting and laughing till tears rolled down. And at last, sure enough, all the circus men could do, the horse broke loose, and away he went like the very nation, round and round the ring, with that sot laying down on him and hanging to his neck, with first one leg hanging most to the ground on one side, and then t'other one on t'other side, and the people just crazy. It weren't funny to me though, I was all of a tremble to see his danger. But pretty soon he struggled up a straddle and grabbed the bridle a reeling this way and that and the next minute he sprung up and dropped the bridle and stood. And the horse a going like a house of fire too. He just stood up there a sailing around as easy and comfortable as if he weren't ever drunk in his life and then he begun to pull off his clothes and sling them. He shed them so thick they kind of clogged up the air and altogether he shed 17 suits. And then there he was, slim and handsome, and dressed the gaudiest and prettiest you ever saw, and he lit into that horse with his whip and made him fairly hum, and finally skipped off, and made his bow and danced off to the dressing room, and everybody just a howling with pleasure and astonishment. See 22-193.jpg 68k. Then the ringmaster he see how he had been fooled, and he was the sickest ringmaster you ever see, I reckon. Why, it was one of his own men. He had got up that joke all out of his own head and never let on to nobody. Well, I felt sheepish enough to be took and so, but I wouldn't have been in that ringmaster's place, not for a thousand dollars. I don't know, there may be bullier circuses than what that one was, but I never struck them yet. Anyways, it was plenty good enough for me, and wherever I run across it, it can have all of my custom. Every time. Well, that night we had our show, but there weren't only about 12 people there, just enough to pay expenses. And they laughed all the time and that made the duke mad and everybody left anyway, before the show was over, but one boy which was asleep. So the duke said these Arkansas lunkheads couldn't come up to Shakespeare, what they wanted was low comedy, and maybe something Ruther worse than low comedy, he reckoned. He said he could size their style. So next morning he got some big sheets of wrapping paper and some black paint and drawed off some handbills and stuck them up all over the village. The bill said. See 22-195.jpg 53k. See 23-196.jpg 167k. Chapter 23. Well, all day him and the king was hard at it, rigging up a stage and a curtain and a row of candles for footlights and that night the house was jam full of men in no time. When the place couldn't hold no more, the duke he quit tending door and went around the back way and come onto the stage and stood up before the curtain and made a little speech and praised up this tragedy and said it was the most thrillingest one that ever was, and so he went on a bragging about the tragedy and about Edmund Keane the Elder, which was to play the main principal part in it. And at last when he got everybody's expectations up high enough, he rolled up the curtain and the Next minute the king come a, prancing out on all fours, naked, and he was painted all over, ring streaked dan. Striped all sorts of colors as splendid as a rainbow. And but never mind the rest of his outfit, it was just wild, but it was awful funny. The people most killed themselves laughing, and when the king got done capering and capered off behind the scenes, they roared and clapped and stormed and ha ha till he come back and done it over again, and after that they made him do it another time. Well, it would make a cow laugh to see the shines that old idiot cut. Then the duke he lets the curtain down and bows to the people and says the great tragedy will be performed only two nights more on accounts of pressing London engagements where the seats is all sold already for it in Drury Lane and then he makes them another bow and says if he has succeeded in pleasing them and instructing them he will be deeply obliged if they will mention it to their friends and get them to come and see it. Twenty people sings out, what is it over? Is that all? The duke says yes. 
Then there was a fine time. Everybody sings out, sold, and rose up mad and was a-going for that stage and them tragedians. But a big, fine-looking man jumps up on a bench and shouts, hold on. Just a word, gentlemen. They stop to listen. We are sold mighty badly sold. But we don't want to be the laughing stock of this whole town, I reckon, and never hear the last of this thing as long as we live. No. What we want is to go out of here quiet and talk this show up and sell the rest of the town. Then we'll all be in the same boat. Ain't that sensible? You bet it is, the judge is right. Everybody sings out. All right, then, not a word about any sell. Go along home and advise everybody to come and see the tragedy. Next day you couldn't hear nothing around that town but how splendid that show was. House was jammed again that night and we sold this crowd the same way. When me and the king and the duke got home to the raft we all had a supper, and by and by about midnight, they made Jim and me back her out and float her down the middle of the river and fetch her in and hide her about two mile below town. The third night the house was crammed again and they weren't newcomers this time but people that was at the show the other two nights. I stood by the duke at the door and I see that every man that went and had his pockets bulging or something muffled up under his coat and I see it weren't no perfumery neither not by a long sight. I smelt sickly eggs by the barrel and rotten cabbages and such things and if I know the signs of a dead cat being around. And I bet I do there was 64 of them went in. I shoved in there for a minute but it was too various for me I couldn't stand it. Well, when the place couldn't hold no more people the duke he give a fellow a quarter and told him to tend door for him a minute, and then he started around for the stage door, I after him, but the minute we turned the corner and was in the dark he says, walk fast now till you get away from the houses, and then shin for the raft like the dickens was after you. I done it and he done the same. We struck the raft at the same time and in less than two seconds we was gliding downstream all dark and still and edging towards the middle of the river nobody sang a word. I reckon the poor king was in for a gaudy time of it with the audience but nothing of the sort, pretty soon he crawls out from under the wigwam and says, well, how'd the old thing pan out this time, duke? He hadn't been uptown at all. We never showed a light till we was about ten mile below the village. Then we lit up and had a supper and the king and the duke fairly laughed their bones loose over the way they'd served them people. The duke says, greenhorns flatheads. I knew the first house would keep mum and let the rest of the town get roped in and I knew they'd lay for us the third night and consider it was their turn now. Well it is their turn and I'd give something to know how much they'd take for it. I would just like to know how they're putting in their opportunity. They can turn it into a picnic if they want to, they brought plenty provisions. Them rapscallions took in $465 in that three nights. I never see money hauled in by the wagon load like that before. By and by when they was asleep and snoring Jim says. Don't it surprise you to weigh dem king's carries on huck? No, I says it don't. Why don't it huck? Well it don't because it's in the breed. I reckon they're all alike. But huck, these kings o' oh, orn is reglar rapscallions, that's just what day is, day's reglar rapscallions. Well that's what I'm a saying, all kings is mostly rapscallions as fur as I can make out. Is that so? You read about them once you'll see. Look at Henry VIII, this NSA Sunday school superintendent to him. And look at Charles II, and Louis XIV, and Louis XV, and James II, and Edward II, and Richard III, and forty more, besides all them Saxon heptarchies that used to rip around so in old times and raise Cain. My you ought to seen old Henry VIII when he was in bloom. He was a blossom. He used to marry a new wife every day and chop off her head next morning. And he would do it just as indifferent as if he was ordering up eggs. Fetch up Nell Gwyn, he says. They fetch her up. Next morning, chop off her head. And they chop it off. Fetch up Jane Shore, he says, and up she comes, next morning, chop off her head, and they chop it off. Ring up Fair Rosamun. Fair Rosamun answers the bell. Next morning, chop off her head. 
And he made every one of them tell him a tale every night, and he kept that up till he had hogged a thousand and one tales that way, and then he put them all in a book and called it Doomsday Book which was a good name and stated the case. You don't know kings, Jim, but I know them, and this old rip of Orne is one of the cleanest I've struck in history. Well, Henry he takes a notion he wants to get up some trouble with this country. How does he go at it give notice, give the country a show? No. All of a sudden he heaves all the tea in Boston Harbor overboard and whacks out a declaration of independence and dares them to come on. That was his style, he never give anybody a chance. He had suspicions of his father, the Duke of Wellington. Well what did he do? Ask him to show up? No, drowned at him in a butt of mamsy like a cat. Suppose people left money laying around where he was, what did he do? He collared it. Suppose he contracted to do a thing, and you paid him and didn't set down there and see that he done it, what did he do? He always done the other thing. Suppose he opened his mouth, what then? If he didn't shut it up powerful quick he'd lose a lie every time. That's the kind of a bug Henry was, and if we'd a had him along stead of our kings he'd a fooled. That town a heap worse than Orne done. I don't say that Orne is lambs because they ain't when you come right down to the cold facts, but they ain't nothing to that old ram anyway. All I say is kings is kings and you got to make allowances. Take them all around they're a mighty ornery lot. It's the way they're raised. But this one do smell so like donation huck. Well they all do Jim. We can't help the way a king smells, history don't tell no way. Now to Duke, he's a tolerable likely man in some ways. Yes, a Duke's different. But not very different. This one's a middling hard lot for a Duke. When he's drunk there ain't no nearsighted man could tell him from a king. Well anyways I don't hanker for no mo on um huck. Dees is all I can stand dot. It's the way I feel too Jim. But we've got them on our hands and we got to remember what they are and make allowances. Sometimes I wish we could hear of a country that's out of kings. What was the use to tell Jim these weren't real kings and dukes? It wouldn't a done no good and besides it was just as I said, you couldn't tell them from the real kind. I went to sleep and Jim didn't call me when it was my turn. He often done that. When I waked up just at daybreak he was sitting there with his head down betwixt his knees moaning and mourning to himself. I didn't take notice nor let on. I knowed what it was about. He was thinking about his wife and his children away up yonder and he was low and homesick because he hadn't ever been away from home before in his life and I do believe he cared just as much for his people as white folks does for their end. It don't seem natural but I reckon it's so. He was often moaning and mourning that way nights when he judged I was asleep and saying, Pa little Elizabeth. Pa little Johnny. It's mighty hard I spec I ain't ever gwine to see you no mo no mo. He was a mighty good nigger Jim was. But this time I somehow got to talking to him about his wife and young ones and by and by he says, what makes me feel so bad this time you z be case I hear something over yonder on de bank like a whack or a slam while ago and it mind me er de time I treat my little Elizabeth so ornery. She warn't ani about fo year ol and she tucked de escarlet fever and had a powerful rough spell, but she got well and one day she was a standin around and I says to her, I says, shet de do dot. She never done it, geez stood da, kinder smilin up at me. It make me mad and I says again mighty loud I says, don't you hear me? Shet je do. She jis stood the same way, kinder smilin up. I was a bylin. I says, I lay I make you mine. And with dat I fetch her a slap side de head dat sont her a sprawlin. Then I went into de other room and you see gone bout 10 minutes, and when I come back da was dat do a stanin open yet, and dat chilly stanin mo's right in it, a lookin down and mournin and de tears runnin down. My but I was mad. I was a gwine for de chili but geez den it was a do dat open innards geez den long come de wind and slam it to behind de chili curb lamb and my lawn de chili never move my breath mo's hop outer me and i feel so so i don't know how i feel 
I crope out all a tremblin' and crope around and open to do easy and slow and poke my head in behind the chilly soft and still and all you via sudden I says POW. Jeez as loud as I could yell. She never budge. Oh huck, I bust out a cryin' and grab her up in my arms and say, oh, de po little thing. De Lord God a mighty fogive po old Jim, cause he never gwine to fogive hisself as long's he live. Oh, she was plump deef and dumb, huck, plump deef and dumb, and I'd been a treat and her so. C24-203.jpg 163k. Chapter 24. Next day, towards night, we laid up under a little willow towhead out in the middle, where there was a village on each side of the river, and the duke and the king begun to lay out a plan for working them towns. Jim he spoke to the duke and said he hoped it wouldn't take but a few hours, because it got mighty heavy and tiresome to him when he had to lay all day in the wigwam tied with the rope. You see, when we left him all alone we had to tie him, because if anybody happened on to him all by himself and not tied it wouldn't look much like he was a runaway nigger you know. So the duke said it was kind of hard to have to lay roped all day and he'd cipher out some way to get around it. He was uncommon bright, the duke was, and he soon struck it. He dressed Jim up in King Lear's outfit, it was a long curtain calico gown and a white horsehair wig and whiskers, and then he took his theater paint and painted Jim's face and hands and ears and neck all over a dead, dull, solid blue, like a man that's been drowned dead nine days. Blamed if he weren't the horriblest looking outrage I ever see. Then the duke took and wrote out a sign on a shingle so, sick Arab, but harmless when not out of his head. And he nailed that shingle to a lath and stood the lath up four or five foot in front of the wigwam. Jim was satisfied. He said it was a sight better than lying tied a couple of years every day and trembling all over every time there was a sound. The duke told him to make himself free and easy, and if anybody ever come meddling around, he must hop out of the wigwam and carry on a little and fetch a howl or two like a wild beast, and he reckoned they would light out and leave him alone. Which was sound enough judgment, but you take the average man and he wouldn't wait for him to howl. Why, he didn't only look like he was dead, he looked considerable more than that. These rapscallions wanted to try the nonsuch again, because there was so much money in it, but they judged it wouldn't be safe, because maybe the news might a worked along down by this time. They couldn't hit no project that suited exactly, so at last the duke said he reckoned he'd lay off and work his brains an hour or two and see if he couldn't put up something on the Arkansas village, and the king he allowed he would drop over to t'other village without any plan, but just trust in providence to lead him the profitable way, meaning the devil, I reckon. We had all bought store clothes where we stopped last, and now the king put his en on, and he told me to put mine on. I done it of course. The king's duds was all black and he did look real swell and starchy. I never knowed how clothes could change a body before. Why, before, he looked like the orneriest old rip that ever was, but now when he'd take off his new white beaver and make a bow and do a smile, he looked that grand and good and pious that you'd say he had walked right out of the ark and maybe was old Leviticus himself. Jim cleaned up the canoe and I got my paddle ready. There was a big steamboat laying at the shore away up under the point, about three mile above the town, been there a couple of hours, taking on freight. Says the king, seein' how I'm dressed I reckon maybe I better arrive down from St. Louis or Cincinnati, or some other big place. Go for the steamboat, Huckleberry, we'll come down to the village on her. I didn't have to be ordered twice to go and take a steamboat ride. I fetched the shore a half a mile above the village and then went scooting along the bluff bank in the easy water. Pretty soon we come to a nice innocent looking young country Jake setting on a log swabbing the sweat off of his face, for it was powerful warm weather and he had a couple of big carpet bags by him. Run her nose in shore, says the king. I done it. Where you bound for, young man? For the steamboat, going to Orleans. Get aboard, says the king. Hold on a minute, my servant LL he pee you with them bags. Jump out and he pee the gentleman Adolphus a meaning me, I see. I done so, and then we all three started on again. The young chap was mighty thankful, said it was tough work toting his baggage such weather. 
He asked the king where he was going and the king told him he'd come down the river and landed at the other village this morning and now he was going up a few mile to see an old friend on a farm up there. The young fellow says, when I first see you I says to myself, it's Mr. Wilkes, sure, and he come mighty near getting here in time. But then I says again, no, I reckon it ain't him or else he wouldn't be paddling up the river. You ain't him are you? No, my name's Blodgett, Alexander Blodgett, Reverend Alexander Blodgett, I suppose I must say, as I'm one o' oh, the Lord's poor servants. But still I'm just as able to be sorry for Mr. Wilkes for not arriving in time, all the same, if he's missed anything by it, which I hope he hasn't. Well, he don't miss any property by it, because he'll get that all right, but he's missed seeing his brother Peter die which he mayn't mind, nobody can tell as to that, but his brother would a give anything in this world to see him before he died, never talked about nothing else all these three weeks, hadn't seen him since they was boys together, and hadn't ever seen his brother William at all, that's the deaf and dumb one, William ain't more than 30 or 35. Peter and George were the only ones that come out here, George was the married brother, him and his wife both died last year. Harvey and William's the only ones that's left now and as I was saying, they haven't got here in time. Did anybody send em word? Oh yes, a month or two ago, when Peter was first took, because Peter said then that he sorta of felt like he weren't going to get well this time. You see, he was pretty old and George's g was too young to be much company for him except Mary Jane, the red-headed one, and so he was kinder lonesome after George and his wife died and didn't seem to care much to live. He most desperately wanted to see Harvey and William, too, for that matter, because he was one of them kind that can't bear to make a will. He left a letter behind for Harvey and said he'd told in it where his money was hid and how he wanted the rest of the property divided up so George's g would be all right, for George didn't leave nothing. And that letter was all they could get him to put a pen to. Why do you reckon Harvey don't come? Where does he live? Oh, he lives in England, Sheffield, preaches there, hasn't ever been in this country. He hasn't had any too much time and besides he mightn't a got the letter at all you know. Too bad, too bad he couldn't a live to see his brothers, poor soul. You going to Orleans you say? Yes, but that ain't only a part of it. I'm going in a ship next Wednesday for Rio Janeiro where my uncle lives. It's a pretty long journey. But it'll be lovely, wished I was a going. Is Mary Jane the oldest? How old is the others? Mary Jane's 19, Susan's 15, and Joanna's about 14, that's the one that gives herself to good works and has a hair lip. Poor things. To be left alone in the cold world so. Well, they could be worse off. Old Peter had friends and they ain't going to let them come to no harm. There's Hobson, the Baptist preacher, and Deacon Lot Hovey, and Ben Rucker, and Abner Shackelford, and Levi Bell, the lawyer, and Dr. Robinson, and their wives, and the widow Bartley, and well, there's a lot of them, but these are the ones that Peter was thickest with, and used to write about sometimes, when he wrote home, so Harvey LL know where to look for friends when he gets here. Well, the old man went on asking questions till he just fairly emptied that young fellow. Blamed if he didn't inquire about everybody and everything in that blessed town, and all about the Wilkeses, and about Peter's business, which was a tanner, and about George's, which was a carpenter, and about Harvey's, which was a dissentering minister, and so on, and so on. Then he says, what did you want to walk all the way up to the steamboat for? Because she's a big Orleans boat and I was afeard she mightn't stop there. When they're deep they won't stop for a hail. A Cincinnati boat will but this is a St. Louis one. Was Peter Wilkes well off? Oh yes, pretty well off. He had houses and land and it's reckoned he left three or four thousand in cash hit up Somers. When did you say he died? I didn't say but it was last night. Funeral tomorrow, likely? Yes, about the middle of the day. Well, it's all terrible sad, but we've all got to go one time or another. So what we want to do is to be prepared, then we're all right. Yes sir, it's the best way. My used to always say that. When we struck the boat she was about done loading and pretty soon she got off. 
the king never said nothing about going aboard so I lost my ride after all. When the boat was gone the king made me paddle up another mile to a lonesome place, and then he got ashore and says, now hustle back, right off, and fetch the duke up here and the new carpet bags. And if he's gone over to t'other side, go over there and get him. And tell him to get himself up regardless. Shove along now. I see what he was up to, but I never said nothing of course. When I got back with the duke we hid the canoe, and then they sat down on a log and the king told him everything, just like the young fellow had said it, every last word of it. And all the time he was a doing it he tried to talk like an Englishman and he done it pretty well, too, for a slouch. I can't imitate him and so I ain't a going to. Try to but he really done it pretty good. Then he says, how are you on the deep and dumb bilge water? The duke said leave him alone for that said he had played a deaf and dumb person on the histronic boards. So then they waited for a steamboat. About the middle of the afternoon a couple of little boats come along, but they didn't come from high enough up the river, but at last there was a big one, and they hailed her. She sent out her yawl, and we went aboard, and she was from Cincinnati, and when they found we only wanted to go four or five mile they was booming mad, and gave us a cussing, and said they wouldn't land us. But the king was Siam. He says, if gentlemen can afford to pay a dollar a mile apiece to be took on and put off in a yawl, a steamboat can afford to carry em, can't it? So they softened down and said it was all right, and when we got to the village they yawled us ashore. About two dozen men flock down when they see the yawl a coming, and when the king says, can any of you gentlemen tell me where Mr. Peter Wilkes lives, they give a glance at one another and nodded their heads as much as to say, what do I tell you? Then one of them says, kind of soft and gentle, I'm sorry sir, but the best we can do is to tell you where he did live yesterday evening. Sudden as winking the ornery old creeter went into smash and fell up against the man and put his chin on his shoulder and cried down his back and says, alas, alas, our poor brother gone and we never got to see him, oh, it's too, too hard. Then he turns around, blubbering, and makes a lot of idiotic signs to the duke on his hands, and blamed if he didn't drop a carpet bag and bust out a crying. If. They weren't the beatenest lot, them two frauds, that ever I struck. Well, the men gathered around and sympathized with them and said all sorts of kind things to them and carried their carpet bags up the hill for them and let them lean on them and cry and told the king all about his brother's last moments and the king he told it all over again on his hands to the duke and both of them took on about that dead tanner like they'd lost the twelve disciples. Well if ever I struck anything like it I'm a nigger. It was enough to make a body ashamed of the human race.